everyone to 130B, quantum mechanics. So today we are going to study a new concept in quantum mechanics, which is called uh, quantum operators. Uh, so me, let me first recap uh, what we have learned so far. Like uh, we, 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 we know that quantum mechanics is a physics theory. It needs to provide description power and also prediction power. By description power, we mean it needs to describe the state of a quantum system. And what we have learned so far is that every state of a quantum system is described by a cat vector. And then in terms of the prediction power, we wish to predict the observables. For example, we want to know if we measure the quantum system, what kind of outcome we will have. Or if the system evolves in time, how does, it, how does it, uh, the state evolve? So all this has to do with how do we change the state. Because when we measure the system, we may change the state. The quantum wave function may collapse. And when we evolve the system, the state, state vector or the wave function may also change. So that's why it's very important to understand how can we modify quantum states? How can we operate on these state vectors? So that leads to the idea of quantum operators. A quantum operator, an operator in quantum mechanics, it acts on a state and returns a new state. So we want to modify the state within the same Hilbert space. That means if we start from a state in an n-dimensional Hilbert space, which is described by a cat vector of n component, then if we operate on the state, we will get a new vector, which is still in the same Hilbert space, meaning that it's still an n-component vector. So it basically is a vector-to-vector -vector mapping. It maps from a cat vector operated by an operator, which we denoted as O with a hat. O stands for operator, hat means every operator, we will, we will label it uh, by a hat to indicate that it's an operator. So operator essentially is a mapping from the Hilbert space back to the Hilbert space itself. So this kind of mapping in mathematics is also called automorphism of Hilbert space. There's always a very special operator that we can always define, which is the identity operator. Identity operator is special because it maps any state back to itself that's like do nothing. So not generally, operator maps Hilbert space to Hilbert space, meaning that it can map to a vector to another vector in different direction. But identity operator is special that it doesn't even change the vector. So any vector in the Hilbert space act by the identity operator remains the same. So that's a definition of operator and identity operator. So uh, how do we how, think about operator acting on a state? Uh, recall that every quantum state is now described by a vector, and previously we have learned that if you multiply a matrix on a vector, you can get a new vector out of that. So based on that intuition, we may conjecture that every quantum operator actually is described by a matrix, and actually a square matrix, because it acts on an uncomponent vector and still remains as an uncomponent vector, which looks like this. When the operator acts on the cat vector and gives you a new vector, uh, this cat vector has n component. The new vector also has n component. From that, you can infer that this operator must be like n, n times n matrix, right? It has n, n rows and n column in order for all these dimensions to match. So indeed, that is a basic assumption in quantum mechanics that every state is only operated or being transformed linearly. Linearly means that what the operator does it doesn't square the vector, it just uh, recombines the basis of the vector. So, uh, so the way that you multiply a matrix on a vector is you take every row of the matrix separately and then perform an inner product with the column vector. So an inner product means that you take the first component, multiply with the first component here, and then multiply these two components, and so on, and then you are uh, adding all the multiplication result together. So that becomes a scalar, and that scalar goes to here, becomes the first component of the resulting vector. Then you take the second row and multiply with the uh, column vector, uh, do an inner product as well, and then that g gives you another scalar, another number, which goes to the second component there. So in this way, you can multiply a matrix with a column vector and result in a new column vector. So uh, in terms of mathematical formula, uh, that is what I wrote uh, down there, uh, the new component in the W vector is related to the component in the V vector by this matrix element. And then you have to sum over the J index, the column index, 
such that the resulting answer only depends on i, which is uh, this wi labels the component in a new vector. Okay, so uh, in this way. Uh, the original cat vector basically described that you are actually combining, linearly combining all the basis vectors with this coefficient v1, v2, and so on. And after the operation, you obtain a new state, which you combine the basis with a different set of coefficient w1, w2. So this operator basically describes how do you transform certain linear combination of a basis state to a new combination of a basis state. So what this matrix element actually tells us is how you recombine these basis states under these transformations. So in order to see that more explicitly, we can study a very special case where we apply this operator on a specific basis state, which we call the J's, uh, let's say, the J's basis state. So if it is a J's basis state, that means a basis vector looks like a one hot a unit vector, right? So uh, for example, the J's basis state means that every component in this vector is zero other than the J's uh, row, which has a one there. So if you try to multiply a generic matrix on that kind of one hot vector, what happens is only the j's column of this matrix will be picked out by this vector. And as a result, the resulting vector will simply be the copy of the j's column. So that means the resulting vector will be a linear combination of all the bases. Now I label the new basis as i. And then the linear combination coefficient is nothing but the j's column of this matrix. So, uh, so this basically describes when the operator acting on one specific basis, what kind of state you will get. You will get a linear superposition of all the bases, and the linear superposition coefficient is specified precisely by the matrix element. This is the meaning of the matrix element in describing these operators. So once you specify all the matrix element, you basically specify the behavior of this operator, how it acts on every basis state. So once you know how operator acts on every basis state, you actually know how operator acts on any state, because any state is, in general, a linear combination of all the bases. So once you know how every basis transform, you also know how every state transform. And then in other words, this, uh, uh, this matrix element OIJ, we, we, we also sometimes call it the amplitude to transform the basis state J to the new basis state I. So you can see if the operator acts on a basis state J, it gives you a linear combination of all the other I bases. And the linear combination coefficient says, how much of this I state do I need to have in my result? So that basically quantifies the amplitude uh, that this transition happens, that the system goes from the J state to the I state under the action of the operator. So that's also the physical meaning. Uh, you can think of it as a, either physical or mathematical meaning of the matrix element. And it is, turns out to be sufficient to specify the operator only by specifying its action on the basis state, as we just said, because any possible state is a linear combination of bases. So uh, the punchline is that uh, state is described by cat vectors, and then operator acting on the state is actually like matrix multiplying a uh, vector. And then all the information about this operator is encoded in this matrix element OIJ. OK, questions? OK, so that's, uh, that's, the, that's the definition. And then uh, there's a way to actually rewrite operator in terms of basis expansions. Uh, this, is, uh, this is like when we say a state is a vector, you can either explicitly write down a column vector with all the components uh, aligned in a column, or you can say it's a linear combination of bases. So when we come to operator, we may also ask whether we can rewrite this operator as a linear combination of some basic operator or basis operators. And that is actually true. Operator can also be thought as a linear combination of something called the basis operators, where basis operator looks like that. Instead of a basis state, which is just described by a single cat labeled by the uh, basis index, a basis operator is labeled by two indices, uh, one for the cat, one for the bra. So it's an outer product between the cat vector and the bra vector. Remember, previously, we have learned the scalar product. Uh, which looks like this. Uh, it's an inner product between the bra vector and the cat 
vector. And the result of the inner product is a number. This, <coughs> this equals a number, basically. But, uh, but if, you, if you do it the other way around, uh, like this i and j, actually, this is, a, this is a matrix. This is no longer a number. So the, the, so the way to memorize it is if, if you look at the inner product, you see from the, looking from outside, it's pointy, right? Pointy is like everything shrink, shrinks to a point. Point is like a number. <laughs> but if you look at this, uh, you have two vertical bars. Vertical bars is like a, if, if you write a matrix, right? If you write a matrix, you have two vertical bars. That's like a matrix. So, uh, so, so that's how you memorize uh, these notations. Uh, OK, so uh, any operator, as I said, can be uh, written as a linear combination of these bases. And then the combination coefficient is simply the matrix element. Maybe at this point, it's not so obvious why the matrix element will also appear here as the uh, linear combination coefficient, but uh, it requires us to have a better understanding of the physical meaning of this basis operator first. So this basis operator, cat, uh, cat i bra j, actually denotes the operator that targets the state j and transform it to the state i. This is because if you try to apply this basis operator on an arbitrary basis state, which I, I call it k, well, k doesn't, doesn't need to be i or j, or, but it also can be i and j. It's just a generic basis. And then what happened is that you can think this is a matrix multiplying this vector, but you can also say, oh, this matrix is just made of two vector outer product with each other. So maybe let me just do the inner product of this vector and this vector together. They give me a number. But if I assume that this J and K, they are all labeling the basis state, then uh, given the property that we always choose orthonormal basis, right? So that means every basis state by itself is normalized. And then every two different basis states, they will be, the basis vector will be orthogonal to each other such that their scalar product is zero. So that the result of this inner product or scalar product is a delta, chronic delta symbol. And what that delta symbol means is that only j equals k, you have a non-trivial result, which is this i state. Uh, when k not equal to j, this delta symbol is simply 0. And the result is also 0. So this is like uh, the, 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 this uh, basis vector specifically pick uh, the, the, or target uh, the basis state. If the basis state turns out to be j, then it returns i. Otherwise, it does nothing. It's, uh, I shouldn't say that's nothing. It returns a zero, basically. So that doesn't contribute to the final result. So this idea is very similar to, for example, gene editing in uh, biosystems, where uh, people discover this uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, system, which is actually a protein carrying a RNA, basically. And then uh, when we want to do gene editing, we want to target specific genes on our DNA. So the reason, to, uh, the way to do that is there's a guiding RNA which, uh, which carry by this protein, and the whole complex is wandering around in your cell. And then when it sees the DNA, which uh, the, the basis matches with, the, uh, with this uh, guiding RNA, that finds the target gene, and then the protein will be activated and cut the gene, and then that allows us to edit the gene. So this idea is that you need to first have a guiding, guiding state. The guiding state will find a perfect match with the target state. And when that match happens, something will become the output, which is this I. So, uh, so this uh, basis operator is like a little machine. It's like this uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, <laughs> machine that uh, it carries uh, uh, guiding uh, state and to match with this uh, target by the inner product, by the scalar product. And then it turns out if the, if the basis is identical, then uh, the operator is activated and then returns the new state. Uh, this is very important that you need to be selective when you do the operation. You cannot just go to in you just, just go into your body and, and modify every gene, right? That's, uh, that's not gene editing. That's basically killing the person. So, uh, so, uh, so, so that's also the same thing for here. A basis uh, operator only do a very specific task, that is uh, taking the J state and then transform it into the I state. But in, if we go back to the original, where we, where we say that, uh, this OIJ exactly is the amplitude to transform the J state to the I state. 
Now this basis operator basically means that you are transforming J to I. So the amplitude to do that should appear as a coefficient in front of these uh, basis operators. So the whole operator is just a combination of all these bases. Every basis operator is doing a very specific task of changing J to I. And then the overall operator is a linear combination of all these tasks such that all of them can be done simultaneously. So this is the, also the power of quantum mechanics. So in classical physics, when we write a computer program, for example, we always write if something, then do something, right? So this can only happen in like a, you need to see a case and do certain specific task. But in quantum mechanics, you can simultaneously uh, identify uh, many different scenarios and do many different tasks all, all in parallel <laughs> because the operator is a quantum superposition of all different tasks. So that's why quantum operator is very efficient in doing, in performing transformations and then that allows many computational tasks to be performed in parallel. So that is also what people hope uh, to be uh, a, a, an advantage of quantum computer. Okay, so this linear combination coefficient, Oij, again, is a complex coefficient because that simply describes the linear combination coefficient in front of the state, which we know state is described by a complex vector in general, so it's also complex. And it turns out you can extract this complex number given the abstract notion of the operator in this way because when the operator acting on the J state, it basically gives you Oij combination of I. But now if you take an inner product, scalar product with the I state, you simply extract this uh, linear combination coefficient. Okay, so, uh, so that's the idea. So that's the two, that's the two very important, <laughs> very important equation that you have to uh, maybe memorize, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so given that, let's look at a very simple example to, uh, to be more, uh, maybe it gives us more intuitive. Uh, so, so this uh, uh, ij, uh, cat i bra j, can be represented actually as a one-hot matrix. Previously, we say that uh, uh, basis uh, vectors is like a one-hot vector. It's zero everywhere. There's only a single one. But these basis operators, they are also one-hot. They are not one-hot matrix, uh, not one-hot vector, but one-hot matrix. The reason is that you can explicitly write it down for, for example, for the for a two-state system. Uh, in a two-state system, the basis is only labeled by one and two. The first basis will have a single one uh, in the first place and first component, and then zero in the second component. This is the corresponding cat. Then the corresponding bra is simply the transpose conjugate of the cat. And we don't need to do conjugate here because it's just real number. But if you take these two vectors and then try to multiply them together following the matrix multiplication rule, what you find is that it gives you a two by two matrix whose every component is zero, only the first component on the first upper corner, <laughs> the first row, first column will be one. Similarly, you can show that all the other uh, outer product of the basis correspond to the one-hot matrix where the one appears in the first row, second column, second row, first column, and the second row, second column. So now, if you linearly combine all these basis operators together with these coefficients, what happens is that O11 will go to this place, O12 will go to this position, and then you are adding them all together, that becomes a matrix, as you wish, as, you, as we previously uh, wished to see. So, so this actually, this kind of explicit calculation shows or justifies what we have uh, just written uh, previously, that an operator represented as a matrix like this can actually be decomposed into a linear superposition of basis operators, where every basis operator is just doing one specific thing of changing the state, changing the guiding state to the output state, basically. <clears throat> So, uh, so uh, with that, uh, this is just a two by two example, but it's easy to imagine that if you have more than two states in your Hilbert space, then uh, a generic operator should be an n by n matrix. Well, the i row j's column matrix element has two meanings. First of all, it describes the linear combination coefficient in front of the basis operator. Secondly, it is also the amplitude to transform a, base, uh, a state j to a state i. And since you have described how to transform every basis state to any other basis state, and that is sufficient to describe the transformation that happens to any vector 
uh, as a linear combination of the basis. Okay, any questions? Okay, so here the take home message is that the state is described by a cat vector and operator is described by a square matrix and then when the operator acts on the state, it changes the state as the matrix multiplying on the vector and change the vector. Here are some examples of operator. First of all, we want to talk about the identity operator, which is a special operator, do nothing operator. <laughs> it is universally represented as identity matrix in any orthonormal basis. The reason is that if you want to figure out what is the matrix element for this identity operator, so which we denoted as identity operator, the i's column, uh, sorry, the i's row and the j's column matrix element, these matrix elements, according to the formula we just present, should be uh, uh, given by this, uh, by this uh, inner product or this scalar product of uh, you are basically sandwiching the operator between the two states. And the, uh, and, the, and the bra state here uh, follows the row, row index, and the cat state here follows the column index. Okay? So if you do that, what happens is that the identity operator will act on the J state, but it's a do nothing operator, so nothing changes. So I immediately sees J, and when they do the scalar product, the result will be the delta symbol. And the delta symbol simply, indi simply indicates that uh, when only when I equals J, you have one, otherwise you have zero, which means in this matrix, all the matrix element will be zero, other than on the diagonal, where I equals J, where the row and column index are the same, the matrix element will be one. So this is the identity matrix. But this is just one way to understand identity matrix. There's another way that is identity operator can also be written as a linear combination of these basis operators. So in general, according to uh, what we derived previously, uh, identity operators should be able to be written as this. But given that this delta, this uh, uh, identity ij is simply delta ij, right? When delta ij meets the summation, so here the summation is summing over two indices, i and j. But when you place a delta symbol here, we say that delta symbol can annihilate with one of the summation. It doesn't annihilate with both of them, only annihilate one of them. For example, I want to cancel out the summation of j. What I need to do is that I remove the delta symbol and the summation of j together, such that I only have a summation of i. But at the same time, I must be very careful that every j in the previous formula must be replaced by i, otherwise it doesn't make sense, right? Otherwise, uh, j just appear from nowhere, that, uh, that's not the right answer. So, uh, so that means the identity operator can actually be written as a single summation instead of a double summation. It's a single summation of all the basis states outer product with itself. So this formula is very important. It's also called the resolution of identity. It allows us to insert basis state into the expression, any expression. <laughs> because any expression, we can insert the identity operator <laughs> inside. For example, if you want to multiply two <laughs> operators together, you can insert identity inside. And then you can use this uh, formula to expand the identity operator as a, uh, as a summation over all the outer product of basis. And this allows you to resolve operator in their uh, basis, which we will see more examples later. Okay, so this is uh, what I want to talk about identity operator and resolution of identity, which is a very important formula. Here, I want to give you a second example, which is about Pauli operators. Pauli operators are special operators for qubits. We have learned that qubits is an uh, interesting quantum uh, system, which has only two distinct states, has a two-dimensional Hilbert space. So if the Hilbert space dimension is two, that means every vector, state vector, is two component, then every operator is a two-by-two two matrix. So Pauli operators are operated in this two-dimensional Hilbert space as two-by-two two matrices. Uh, so you can write that as a linear combination of basis operator. And, uh, and for qubits, we label the basis instead of one and two, uh, by, but, but we label it by zero and one. It's just uh, for qubits, we do that kind of the labeling. So, uh, so there are three uh, in Pauli operators, uh, which people call sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. Uh, <coughs> 
and they are just defined this way, so, <laughs> so uh, this, uh, this is the definition. Uh, sometimes we also include the identity operator in this two-dimensional Hilbert space, which is this, uh, this one, uh, which is called the zeroth Pauli operator. You may call this the first Pauli, second, and third, the one, two, three, and then this is a zero. So, uh, so all together, they form uh, basically four matrices. Uh, this is uh, identity, uh, the first uh, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. The way to write these, uh, uh, to convert this expression to this matrix is you basically, let's say, let's take sigma y, for example. You look at this expression and first look at the uh, basis operator. The basis operator tells you where you should put the coefficient at. So the basis operator, the first index is the row index. Second index is the column index, which means you need to put the i on the first row and the zeros column. First row and zeros column is here. It's here. So this is the first row and the zeros column. You put the i there. And then the second term tells you you need to go to the first col uh, for, uh, zeros row and first column, and then put the minus i as a coefficient there. right? So, so in this way, you can, you can I, I hope you can freely convert <laughs> between these two expressions. You can, whenever you see a linear combination of basis operator like that, you can automatically <laughs> imagine that there's a matrix uh, which is behind uh, this uh, uh, kind of uh, expression. Uh, the, the matrix, of course, is more uh, straightforward and it's very intuitive. Uh, but this uh, matrix, you can see when I write the matrix, I was too careful that I put a hump equal there. That, that means this matrix representation is basis dependent. It depends on the fact that you are choosing the basis state as one hot vectors. But it's not necessary, right? The basis state is a set of orthonormal states. It does not need to be one hot vector. One hot vector is just a human choice. And the way that we can write this operator as this matrix depends on that human choice. So if you don't want to be basis dependent, this is the more uh, rigorous way of writing down uh, or defining the operator basic, uh, uh, just based on the <laughs> basis operators. So OK. So that's why uh, people invent two different ways to write down operators, either as a matrix or as a linear combination of basis operators. <clears throat> Any questions? OK, very good. So now we can <laughs> proceed uh, to a new uh, idea, which is called operator algebra. So we talk about operator can act on states, but actually operator can also <laughs> combine with operators. So, uh, so that's like we know that previously in linear algebra, if we have a matrix, we can multiply the matrix on a vector that gives you a new vector, but we can also multiply two matrices together. Uh, and especially in quantum mechanics, these operators are square matrix, which means the number of columns and number of rows are the same. So if you have an n by n square matrix, multiply with the n by n square matrix, the result is still a square matrix of n by n, right? So that means it is possible to multiply two operators together. But what does it mean physically to operate, uh, to multiply or to product two operator together? The physical meaning of that is called operator composition <coughs> or operator product. The product or composition of two operators is a combined operator, which we call O and P. Uh, so uh, the two operators we are going to multiply or combine is O and P. So O and P represent different operations that we can perform on the state. So what do we mean by a combined operator? The combined operator means that we first apply P to the state, and then we apply O to the state. As a result, uh, they, they, they act together <laughs> uh, one after another. That, that whole thing can be, can be thought as a new operator, just directly acts on the state. So that means <clears throat> the combination of O and P operator as a new operator acting on the state is basically decomposed into P acting on the state first, and then followed by O acting on the state. And this becomes obvious because if you just imagine that every state is a cat vector, it becomes a column vector, and then every operator becomes a matrix, what is being on the left-hand side is just matrix, matrix, and a vector. And then I'm just doing associativity of matrix multiplication that uh, it turns out uh, in linear algebra, matrix multiplication is associative, meaning that you can either do A, B, and then C, or A and B, C. That's the idea. So you can either do these two together first or do that two together. So uh, that's why uh, uh, you can uh, have this property. 
And then, uh, uh, as I said, because uh, these are just matrices, and the way that uh, they act on, the ma act, uh, act on the state is like a matrix multiplication. So when you combine two operators, you simply just need to first, com uh, first multiply these two matrix together, because this will give you a new matrix, which will represent the action of the new op combined operator on the state. So, uh, so the punchline is that composing two operators uh, will be represented as multiplying the corresponding two matrices. <coughs> is that uh, OK? OK, but then we know there's a very important thing that uh, when you multiply two numbers, it's uh, commutative, meaning that uh, 2 times 3 is 3 times 2. But when you multiply two operators, O times P uh, and P times O, they are generally not the same. <laughs> so previously, when we review linear algebra, I think I pre present the example where we have two matrices. And you can see, Mathematica tells us that the result of exchanging the order in, multipli in matrix multiplication matters. In, uh, in general, matrix uh, multiplication do not commute with each other. You can't exchange their order. And it is because of this very important property that makes a huge difference between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. Uh, for example, uncertainty principle has something to do with this uh, very, uh, very fundamental mathematical fact. <clears throat> like a position and momentum operator, they don't commute with each other. OK, so we will talk about that later. But uh, at the present time, let's uh, first look at a simple uh, uh, a table where we just, exp uh, we just explain or introduce uh, Pauli operators as uh, three or, or maybe four uh, very important <laughs> operators which act in a two-dimensional Hilbert space for a single qubit. So actually, these four operators as four different matrices, every one of them is a two by two matrix. You can actually form a multiplication table, which means uh, when you try to multiply uh, this operator with that operator, then the result will be this operator. So if you take sigma x and sigma y, both of them are two by two matrices. Uh, you can try that at home. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through every, uh, every detail, but uh, this is the table that you get. Okay? So if you, don't, uh, 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 if you have any difficulty in figuring that out, you can go to the exercise six. Remember, we have this uh, little <laughs> button there. If you click that button, and then uh, it gives you a <laughs> set of code. <laughs> There's a mathematical code which explicitly check uh, the matrix representation of each one of them. If you don't even believe in Mathematica, you can try to do it by hand, but I can ensure you that's a very tedious work. Uh, uh, but anyway, you just need to believe me that uh, people have uh, done all this uh, tedious stuff, and then this is the multiplication table that people summarize. But this table, every time, if you just want to do mul matrix multiplication and look at the table, it's not very efficient. Uh, that, let me tell you some uh, interesting rules. For example, if you have identity operator multiplying with any operator that is remaining the same as the any operator, right? So or any operator multiply with identity operator is still any operator. The reason is identity operators simply uh, correspond to do nothing operation. So if you first perform something and then do nothing, then what you are getting is you perform that something, right? So that's why identity operator, no matter it composed from the left or from the right uh, with another operator, it's not going to change the operator. So we have uh, understand the first row and the first column in this table. And what about the, uh, the other, uh, th these three identities? They are very interesting. It turns out that these uh, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z uh, Pauli operators or Pauli matrices has nice properties that when they square, meaning that when they apply twice, uh, it's, uh, it becomes identity. Uh, it is because, for example, sigma z operator is like, <clears throat> uh, if I remind you, sigma, sigma, for example, let me take sigma z operator. <laughs> as an example, and sigma x operator is like that. Remember, the, phys the, the geometric meaning of these matrices previously, we have shown that this uh, just uh, doesn't change the first component of the vector, but give a minus sign to the second component. That's why if you do this twice, the second component will get two minus sign, and eventually the vector is not going to change. So that's why if you square this matrix, it becomes an identity operator. And then this matrix is just exchanging the first and second component of whatever matrix, uh, whatever vector that it acts on. So if you do this uh, 
component exchange twice, uh, you go, go back to the original vector. So that's also why sigma x uh, doesn't uh, it apply twice, doesn't change the, uh, the state. And then uh, the, it's the same for sigma y. You can check that. And then the only thing that re requires us to memorize is all these very uh, uh, terrible <laughs> poly operator with an additional i in the front. And the rule is basically, basically that if you go as x, y, then it goes to z. So if you go from y multiply z, it goes to x. And then if you go from z to x, it goes to y. So x, y, z, or y, z, x, or z, x, y. If you put, <laughs> if you put uh, x, y, and z in a line, uh, if you multiply the first two, you get the third one. You can think this sequence is repeating indefinitely, <laughs> both from left and right. So if you want to multiply y and z together, you get a sigma x with an i in the front. You want to multiply z and x together, you get a sigma y and with an i in the front. Okay? But if you want to multiply the other way around, y and x, you get the minus i in the front of a sigma z. So you're still go, going to get z. But if you're going in the opposite order, the i factor will become minus. Okay? Minus i. So that's the rule. OK, so these rules can be actually uh, summarized in such a very uh, 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 simple formula. Um, maybe not so simple, but uh, 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 yeah, let, let's take a look at it. So this, uh, uh, this basically describes if you have two poly matrices labeled by A and B, where A, B takes value from X, Y, Z, and then if A and B are the same, then the delta symbol uh, become effective, then the result will be simply an identity operator. But if A and B are different, then there's another symbol, which is called the Levi-Civita symbol. And this symbol is very interesting. It's uh, basically a totally anti-symmetric tensor, which means if A, B, C is uh, following the cyclic order of X, Y, Z, which goes like uh, either X, Y, Z or Y, Z, <laughs> X or Z, X, Y, so that's like a cyclic of this X, Y, Z. If A, B, C follow this cyclic, the answer is plus one. And if A, B, C is anti-cyclic, that means it's going in the other way, then the answer is minus one. So this basically describes that if you a, a, multiply A and B together, if A and B are not the same thing, you get the third one, which is uh, sigma C. But, uh, but depending on whether you are following this order, X, Y, Z, or anti, uh, anti, uh, against this order, you get an I factor in the front with a plus minus sign ambiguity given by the levi civita symbol. Okay? That's, uh, that's the idea. <clears throat> Another way of writing down this formula <laughs> is this uh, equation uh, 180, uh, sorry, 1108, uh, which goes like this. If you have, uh, uh, let me first explain what, does, what do I mean by m dot sigma. So sigma, we, we know there are three Pauli operators, sigma x, sigma y, uh, sigma z. So you can think these three operators also form a vector, right? Because it's like three components. But this vector is very non-trivial. Previously, when we talk about vector, we are saying it's an array of numbers. But now, this vector is an array of operators. But it's OK. If you think about vector as a data structure in computer science, you can vector anything, right? Any object. So you can have operators also forming a vector, array of vectors. So when we say m dot sigma, m is a unit vector which is made of array of numbers. So m has mx, my, and mz component. So these three components, uh, uh, turns out, uh, they can be complex, but it doesn't matter. Real is also OK. So, uh, so you have three numbers. Uh, and then when you dot product with uh, these uh, three uh, operators, what happens is you take every component, multiply them together, and then summing them up. So that's, the, uh, that's, uh, that's what we mean by this uh, vector, dot product with a vector version of the operator, right? So uh, the resulting thing is that because every operator is a two by two matrix, and this is combining, you are linearly combining matrices with this coefficient, where the coefficients are numbers. And then these numbers uh, linear combining the matrix, the result is still a two by two matrix. You just need to take all these matrix components, multiply those numbers, add them together, that's two by two matrix. So every this m dot sigma basically labels, every m vector labels a two by two matrix like this. 
like this. So this n dot sigma is also another two by two matrix, which is similar to this one just by replacing every m by n. So now, if you have two matrices, one labeled by m vector, the other labeled by the n vector, and then you want to multiply these two by two matrices together, the result is still a two by two matrix. And this formula precisely tells you what's the result. The result will be decomposed into a linear combination of identity operator and the Pauli matrices again. So in this way, you basically, uh, basically uh, take the two Pauli operator product together and then, and then expand it into a linear combination uh, that involve at most only one Pauli operator. So you are reducing the number of Pauli operators in your expression. That's how we do Pauli matrix multiplication. So this formula will be very useful. It tells you what the linear combination coefficient should be in front of all these uh, operators. For example, m dot n is the inner product of these two vectors, m cross n. m and n are all three component vectors, so cross product is just literally the cross product you learn. Uh, uh, by taking the determinant. So it, uh, the result is also a three component vector, so that's why you can inner product with the uh, Pauli operator vector again, okay? So, uh, so, so this is how you can multiply Pauli operators together. This formula, sometimes people also call it operator product expansion, OPE, uh, because this is operator and then product and then expand, right? <laughs> operator product expansion. Operator product expansion is very important in quantum field theory. It describes how we fuse two particles together. Uh, uh, it is a very fundamental process when you want to have a neutrino and an electron and then <laughs> bouncing with each other. Then basically each one, each particle is actually described by an operator in quantum field theory. And then the coming, the resulting, uh, uh, the results, <laughs> resulting particle is given by the operator product expansion. Uh, but, but here we don't have uh, that complicated things yet, but you, I'm just saying that uh, this is a very useful formula. So now if you know how to fuse two operators together or how to product two operators, then there's no difficulty to product three operators together because operator combination or this uh, product is associative, meaning that if you want to do three matrices, each one is two by two, if you want to combine all these three Pauli matrices together, um, you just need to do the first two, and then, and then, and then do the, the, the other one, multiply into that, right? So you just need to keep applying the rules we, uh, uh, we uh, develop uh, in, the, uh, in the above. And then I'm not going to the detail, but uh, the result, again, you can see, uh, becomes a very complicated uh, formula, and it will become even more complicated if you try four operators, but uh, I'm not going to there. So it's, and again, a linear combination of identity and Pauli. Okay, so, uh, so if you don't know how to derive that, you can try to check out in the exercise seven. Uh, but I suggest you not to always look at the answer, <laughs> first try yourself, and that will be very helpful, I think. Uh, so this is all I want to say about uh, Pauli operators and their uh, product. Any questions? <clears throat> okay, uh, oh, oh yeah, questions. Oh, because we want to, we, we, uh, not, not because we want to use two, it's, uh, it's, it's saying that every three component vector, M, labels a two by two matrix. So now we want to understand how to multiply two by two matrix together. So we start from the simplest case, we we'll multiply two matrices together. So each matrix will be labeled because I don't want to write down this matrix explicitly as a four component thing, right? So instead of uh, just writing down the matrix, I'm saying that this matrix can be parameterized by these uh, three, three component vector N and this three component vector N. So you should think that every uh, vector <laughs> labels a matrix. Now I understand how to multiply two of them together, then based on that, I can also understand how to multiply three and more together, yeah. So that's why we start from two. Two is the, everything, every multiplication starts from defining a binary operation, right? So, uh, so it's uh, the idea. Okay. Okay, so maybe we still have six minutes and then <laughs> let me quickly uh, 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 go through uh, 
maybe uh, we, we can talk about it more next time. Uh, because this matrix multiplication is not commutative, and then that leads to a very important concept called commutator. Commutator is the quantity or, or the operator which quantifies the amount of non-commutativity between two operators. So, uh, for example, if I have two operator O and P, uh, in general, OP doesn't equals to PO. So, O times P is like two matrix multiplied together. The result is still a matrix. P times O is another matrix, but these two matrices may not be the same. So, we just take their difference uh, because these two matrices are both n by n matrix. So, it's legitimate to take their difference, and their difference is called the commutator. So commutator, which we denoted using this uh, bracket, square bracket O, uh, comma P, square bracket, uh, to denote this commutator. So uh, it basically just means OP minus PO. Commutator is anti-symmetric because if you follow this definition, exchanging the place between P and O, then you can see you are exchanging the first term with the second term. But because there's a minus sign in between, then it gets, actually gets an overall minus sign. And as a result, commutator of any operator with itself always vanish, because OO commutator basically means OO minus OO. But OO is the, OO must be the same, right? Operator multiply with itself. It's just square of that matrix that should have a unique answer. And then OO that cannot be not equal to OO. So that's why any operator multiply, uh, uh, commutator with itself will always vanish. So you never need to worry about the commutator of an operator with itself. <coughs> But uh, for different operator O and P, the commutator may not vanish, but it just may not. It doesn't say it never vanishes. So there is the case where the commutator vanishes for two operator. In that case, we say that these two operators are so special that they commute with each other. Uh, or another way of saying that is OP equals PO. The operator can pass through each other as if they were numbers. Because we remember that when we multiply two numbers together, you can freely commute their order. So uh, if two operators act like a commute, uh, a commute to each other, uh, you can almost think that uh, as if they are numbers. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter which operator applies the first, the sequence will always give you the same result. Here are some interesting examples where we encounter non-commutativity in our daily life. For example, I'm going to dress up for school, and there I can either put on my socks, put on my shoes, and put on the hat. So put on the socks and put on the shoes don't commute because you usually put on the socks and then put on the shoes, right? You don't do it the opposite way. If you do it the opposite way, you end up with a different dressing, right? So the outcome is different. So A and B are two operations that you can apply to yourself that do not commute. But B and C is commuting because put on the shoes and put on the hat it uh, doesn't matter, uh, it's on different places. So no matter which, which thing you do first, uh, it's going to commute. So exchanging their order doesn't matter. So that's what we mean by what the operator commute and not commute. It depends on whether if you exchange the ordering of applying the operator to the state, whether the result is the same or the different. And then the commutator is the idea which actually quantifies the amount of difference uh, uh, when you exchange the order of operators. And then commutator has some, uh, some uh, mathematical rules uh, which you can try to prove that following these exercises. Uh, uh, one very uh, important rule is called the bilinearity. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's not, a, a, not only linearity, it's bi, meaning that no, it's linear both, both in the <laughs> second place and in the, second, in the first argument. Uh, so, so if you, if you have, have a O and then P and Q, are two matrices linear combined with each other, the commutator between between these two is simply the commutator between O and P and O and Q. And then I think these rules are quite obvious if you are familiar with matrix multiplication and linear combination. So you can basically, uh, uh, basically distribute uh, commutators uh, through these uh, additions or linear combinations. There's another uh, a less obvious rule, which is called the product rule. So if you have O and P and Q, but this time P and Q are not adding together, but they are multiplying together, but you want to calculate the commutator between O and the product of P and Q, it turns out the result is O and P commutator multiply Q, and O and Q commutator multiply P from the other side. 
So how to memorize this? I, I'm not going to prove that because you can click this button and then see the proof, but I'm going to explain how to do this. So when it, whenever you see a commutator like that, you basically uh, split this product and then push the later operator to the end, to the to the right of the, pro to the commutator and push the operator that is already on the left to the leftmost of this commutator. So you are basically pushing, each time pushing one operator out of the bracket, either to the <laughs> leftmost or to the rightmost, depending on whether they are on the left or on the right at the beginning. So that's the rule, okay? This product rule is very similar to what you learn in the uh, calculus. When you want to take the derivative of a function, which uh, the function is a product of two functions, you basically need to take the derivative of the first function followed by the product of the second function, and then the derivative of the second function followed by the product of the first function. But it's just because in the calculus, these functions are ca multiplying in the real domain. They are numbers, so they commute with each other, so we never care about their orders. But however, for operators, they don't commute, so that's why you need to care about the orders, and the way to care about the orders to remember the order where they come from originally in the uh, commutator. The rule also apply for the second one. So, uh, so these are the ideas. So that's it for today. Thank you.